in color. The continuing story of Peyton Place. Starring Dorothy Malone as Constance McKenzie, Ed Nelson as Michael Rossi, Ryan O'Neill as Rodney Harrington, Barbara Parkins as Betty Anderson, Tim O'Connor as Elliot Carson, Christopher Connolly as Norman Harrington, Patricia Morrow as Rita Harrington, James Douglas as Stephen Corn. Elliot Carson, editor of the Clarion, has just filed an objective, impersonal story on the subject of the People versus Lee Weber, a young man charged with the killing of Ann Howard. An objective, impersonal story written by a passionately interested man. Subject of the story, the first major witness for the prosecution, the late Ann Howard's fiance, Dr. Michael Rossi. So what you've told us, Dr. Rossi, is that your deepening friendship and eventual love for Ann Howard was checkered by a series of harassments. Harassments which were perpetrated on her by the accused, Lee Weber, which indicated an attitude of bitter and unremitting hostility on his part. Yes. Your Honor, at this time I would like to examine these incidents and corroborate them with the witness. Proceed, Mr. Fowler. Thank you, Your Honor. Man's pretty cool up there. Dr. Rossi, you stay. He's always cool. April, you mm. drove your then car again, so are you. Garage. Yes, I did. Did you talk to anyone there? Yes, Lee Weber. What was the substance of your conversation? I brought my car in there to be serviced, and looked like it was going to take the better part of the day, so he offered me his car. Did you take him up on his offer? Yes. Later on that day, he brought me my car at the hospital. Was Ann Howard employed at the hospital at that time? Yes, she was. Now, did the accused leave the hospital directly after turning your car back over to you? He went into the therapy room, and he talked with Ann Howard. Uh, Mr. Fowler, Your Honor, I don't want my answers to imply something that happened more than that. I, well, I have a, a very strong responsibility here, and I have a feeling that my answers are adding up to something that, uh, about something they don't mean. We appreciate your feeling of responsibility, Dr. Rossi. However, this court is experienced enough to draw conclusions only where they are warranted. Proceed, Mr. Fowler. Dr. Rossi, after Miss Howard's death, did you, as her fiancé, pay off the balance of a sum of money that she owed to Rodney Harrington's garage? I did. How had she contracted this debt? Well, she bought a car at the garage. Who sold her the car? Lee Weber. Uh, Your Honor, I would like at this time to place before the court this garage statement. It itemizes repairs made on the car in question, specifically major repairs to the shock absorbers, ball joint suspension, and the steering column. Let the record show the statement was accepted as people's number five. Did Lee Weber ever mention to you that the car should be repaired before it could be driven safely? No, no, he didn't. To your knowledge, did he ever tell Miss Howard of the unsafe condition of the car before he sold it to her? Objection. There's no way of establishing that. Sustain. Please be careful, Mr. Fowler. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did you have any subsequent conversations with the accused? Yes, I did at the, uh, at the garage. I, I, I gave him a warning. A warning? Yes. Uh, Ann Howard had come to me at the office at the hospital. She was upset. It seemed that... Lee Weber had detained her at the hospital. Objection. The witness is continually relying on hearsay, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Hearsay, Dr. Rossi, is a category of inadmissible evidence. Dr. Rossi, what was the nature of the warning you gave the accused? Well, I told him to stop with his harassment of Miss Howard, and that if he didn't, he'd have to deal with me. And what was the accused's response to your warning? He didn't like it. He. Uh, he began to argue about it. Was he hostile? Yes. Did he agree not to bother Miss Howard again? No. No, he never agreed to that. I see. 
Uh, doctor, did you shortly after this receive a phone call from Mrs. Elliot Carson? Yes, yes, I did. What was the substance of the phone call? Well, Mrs. Carson called me to, uh, to warn me that, that Lee Weber was out on some kind of a drunken spree. She thought it was a possibility he might intend to harm Ann Howard. But I think it ought to be stated at this point that on that day, Lee Weber was fired from his job, and it might have been that he was just out blowing off steam or something. But in any case, he didn't approach Miss Howard. Hey, what's going on? I know that. Because I don't know. He was with me when He's Carson kicking was towards the wrong goalpost. Your Honor, the concluding part of the witness's statement was not responsive to my question. I move it be stricken from the record. Strike it as non-responsive. Dr. Rossi, did you talk with Miss Howard on the day of her death? Yes, I did twice. What exactly did you talk about the first time? Well, I was in my office and I told her that uh, when she got off of work, I wanted her to go to the beach cottage and wait there until I came home. Why did you feel it necessary to issue such an ultimatum to Miss Howard? Dr. Rossi, shall I repeat the question? No, Mr. Fowler, I heard you. I was concerned. I was very concerned about her welfare. Please be more specific, Doctor. She, uh, she didn't feel that she was in any danger. I, I couldn't convince her that she was. I, I tried. What kind of danger? Are you referring to the threats made to her by the accused? Objection, Your Honor. Leading the witness. Strike the question. Dr. Rossi, I want to read to you a section of the statement that you made prior to this hearing. Quote, the day Anne died, she came to the hospital in the morning. After we talked, I instructed her to go directly to my place after work and to wait there for me. I didn't know what Lee Weber's frame of mind was, and I didn't want her to take any chances. I thought she'd be safe out at the beach. End quote. Are these your words, doctor? Yes, they are. Then, in effect, you were more than just generally concerned about Ann Howard's welfare that day, weren't you? You were specifically worried about what might happen to her if she encountered Lee Weber, the man whose hatred for her had continued unabated ever since she first came back to town. Isn't that true, Dr. Ross? I object, Your Honor. Mr. Fowler. That's all, Doctor. <laughs> say it was uh, well, a little ambiguous. Were you disappointed? Yes, I was disappointed. What happened? Listen, I'm sorry I wasn't as adamant about Lee Weber's guilt as you would have me be. Well, even the district attorney was obviously surprised and disappointed. Well, I'll apologize to him later. Well, take your guard down, Mike. I'm not attacking you, and I'm not criticizing you at all. After all, we're all involved in this. In what, exactly? In Lee Weber. What happened to Lee Weber? I thought we all understood that Weber was responsible for Anne's death. The same way we understood that he was partially responsible for Allison's disappearance. That's why your testimony in court confuses me. You've changed your mind, haven't you, Mike? Why? I'll give you the best of it, Elliot. And say you're not trying to influence a witness before he's been cross-examined. Now listen, you know better than that. I'm asking you a question. Why? I suppose we let Steve and John Fowler ask all the questions. That's quite a boy, Connie. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. <laughs> quite a boy. <laughs> oh, thanks. Can't stay long. How are you feeling? Fine. Are the nurses treating you all right? Of course. Everything's fine. Hey, is there anything that you need? More visitors like you. <laughs> you know, it's going to be wonderful to have somebody call me grandfather again.
course it will. Oh, Connie, I'm sorry. That was stupid of me. I was thinking of Allison, but I didn't mean to speak out about it. Matthew's lucky to have a grandpa like you. Well, Matthew was going to change a lot of things around here for the good. He's going to be especially important to Elliot. To Elliot? What about me? Oh, he'll be important to you, too. Don't quote me, but I've suspected for years that mothers are much more important to children than fathers. Well, that's better. <laughs> You're teasing me, but I'm kind of serious. Just don't tell Elliot that I said so. Oh, I wouldn't dare. Now, Connie, about Matthew being important to Elliot, I meant that. He's going to be different. He's going to grow. I love Elliot the way he is. I know that. But I'm sure that Allison thought Elliot didn't love her, didn't respect her, and didn't need her love. Well, this little fellow's going to change all that, because he's going to love Elliot. He's going to look up to him, and he's going to reach out for him every day. <laughs> Can you imagine Elliot when that little puddin' calls him daddy for the first time? <laughs> oh, my. What a day that's going to be. And Elliot and his son are going to grow up together. And you three are going to have a wonderful new life together. And Connie, I can't tell you how that pleases me. I'm a little disappointed you didn't notice I've been growing up. What? Well, I didn't bring a ridiculous, big, useless toy. I noticed, and I'm very proud of you. <laughs> well, forget it, because I ordered one sent to the house. <laughs> and Constance, when they bring Matthew to you, tell him a little something about his grandfather. 